Namaste, my dear brothers and sisters. The love and blessings of the mother and Sri to all of you from Sri Aurobindo Ashram Delhi branch. Blood is something so intimate to us that uh, we use it uh, often in uh, language, uh, like, uh, say, teaching is in my blood. What I mean is that my father was a very good teacher. Probably that's why I can teach well. But then we know that scientifically, uh, we don't really inherit uh, qualities through the blood. It is through genes. Uh, then in the same way, you know, when uh, uh, we ask for a great sacrifice or we make a great sacrifice, it's thought in terms of blood. Like Nitaji Subhash Chandra Bose said, give me blood and I'll give you freedom. So that is considered the highest sort of a sacrifice because of the importance that we attach to blood. And in fact, uh, the ancients, when they observed that uh, when the blood stops flowing, the person dies, concluded that uh, probably life resides in blood. And in a way it does, because we have seen that uh, for staying alive, the cells of our body, all the cells of our body, should be surrounded by a fluid which is suitably wet, warm and salty and uh, should have food available, should not have an accumulation of waste products and so on. And this is achieved in spite of a very small amount of fluid surrounding the trillions of our cells because uh, this fluid is uh, in intimate contact with the blood and uh, it is the blood from where the nutrition comes, the oxygen comes and into which the waste products are dumped and this blood is not stationary, it is flowing. And that's how the cells are able to get the type of conditions under which uh, they can live. So that is the great contribution that blood makes to the body by transporting food and oxygen towards the cells and taking away from the cells their waste products. So essentially the function of blood is transport. It's like a flowing river and uh, it brings something that we need and takes away what we, what the cells don't need. Now let me turn to the digital board. One type of cells are the red blood cells. The red blood cells. If we look at a red blood cell from the side, it is somewhat like this, which means that the center is thinner and uh, the periphery is thicker. And uh, this seems to be a great advantage because uh, under some conditions the cells might swell and uh, this leaves scope for swelling without bursting. On the other hand, you can imagine that uh, if it was already like this, as happens in some diseases like spherocytosis, this cell, if it swells a bit, it is likely to burst. Apart from this, probably this shape also gives the advantage that it can squeeze through very narrow capillaries, some of which may be just about the same or slightly smaller in diameter than the red blood cell itself. And therefore, it can bend and squeeze through those blood vessels without any problem. So, it's a very beautifully constructed cell. But however, it hardly looks like a cell because uh, it has no nucleus. Uh, it's a bag of hemoglobin. About one third of it is hemoglobin and two thirds is water and uh, some salts, etc. dissolved in that water. Uh, but then to start with, it is a cell with a nucleus and everything. Uh, the red cells are manufactured in the bone marrow. And to start with, they start as... Uh, cells which have the potential of forming a large variety of blood cells, including red cells. And these cells multiply very fast. These are undifferentiated, but just have the potential of forming blood cells. Then, you know, it distinguishes itself, differentiates itself, so that it still continues to divide, but now it has committed itself to forming a red blood cell. It's not totipotent anymore. Now it has committed itself to forming a red blood cell. It continues to multiply and differentiate and uh, as it differentiates more, it acquires, it starts manufacturing hemoglobin, but it still has a nucleus. And then it multiplies uh, further 
and differentiates further and eventually gets rid of the nucleus. The nucleus is lost. And that is when it becomes a proper red blood cell and is uh, sent into the circulation. But then uh, uh, it's able to live for a limited period of time even without the nucleus, uh, but uh, not for very long. And therefore, its life is rather limited, about three months. So the red cell lives after about three months, which means that uh, then it is destroyed and there are places in the body where it is destroyed and the debris can be taken care of. And uh, uh, the dead cells are replaced by the new cells that are formed. That happens all over the body. So that applies also to the red blood cells. The second category of cells are the white blood cells. And uh, they come in a large variety. One of those, one variety of red blood cells have a multi-lobed nucleus which means the nucleus has multiple lobes and it has fine purplish granules in the cytoplasm. And this type of cells are called neutrophils. or polymorphs. Another type have a nucleus that is generally bilobed And the granules in this type of uh, cell are larger, not as thin as uh, in the neutrophils, and uh, they are reddish in color. These are the cells that are called eosinophils. And then you have uh, Yet another category of cells with granules in their cytoplasm. And uh, these cells have a fragmented nucleus, two or three fragments of the nucleus. And uh, then the cell has uh, a large number of thick granules, bluish in color. which are jam-packed, you know, the cell is jam-packed with these granules to the extent that in the nucleus may be covered with these granules. And these are the cells that are called the basophils. So when you see your blood report and you find uh, the percentage of different types of white blood cells, the neutrophils or the polymorphs, eosinophils and basophils, you know uh, what they look like under the microscope. And why they have been given these names is because the commonest stain, that is the coloring chemical with which uh, the blood film is stained before you look at it under the microscope, it has acidic and basic dyes. The acidic, acidic dye is uh, reddish in color and uh, the granules which take up that acidic dye, eosin, uh, are called eosinophils because their granules uh, have an affinity for uh, this acidic dye and uh, eosin, and uh, therefore they become they are they acquire this reddish color. And uh, the basophils have granules which have an affinity for uh, the blue dye, the hematoxylin, and uh, the neutrophils 
probably pick up a bit of both and that's how they acquire a purplish color. So the names, all uh, neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils are based on the type of uh, affinity that their granules have for uh, the different types of dyes which are used commonly for uh, staining these cells. And because these cells have granules in their cytoplasm, they are called granulocytes. So this is one category of white blood cells. Then there is another category which does not have uh, these granules. And uh, these are of two varieties, the two types of cells that do not have uh, granules. One type of uh, these cells without granules in their cytoplasm have a nucleus that is uh, bilobed, but not like that of an eosinophil. It is somewhat kidney shaped. So this is the nucleus. And in cytoplasm, there are no granules. And these are the cells which are called monocytes. And these are the cells that migrate from the blood into the tissues and become phagocytes. Phagocytes are cells which can eat up something, so they can eat up germs and other foreign substances. The other type of uh, cells without granules have uh, a nucleus which is very big. It occupies almost the entire cell leaving behind only a thin rim of cytoplasm. And uh, these cells are called lymphocytes. And because these cells have no granules, they are the agranulocytes. Now, how much of these cells are you? There's still one more variety of cells, and I'm sure uh, one of you would have pointed out if I didn't talk about it before going any further. And uh, because these are the cells that we hear about a lot these days in situations like the dengue fever, their count goes down the platelets. The platelets are rather small, they are not proper cells, they are fragments of cells. They originate in the bone marrow like the other blood cells from a very huge cell called the megakaryocyte. Mega because very big. And uh, as it develops, it fragments into these platelets. And uh, although like the red cells, again, they don't have a nucleus, they are virtual laboratories with a very large number of chemicals, chemicals which participate in the hemostatic process that is checking bleeding after we have a wound. And uh, these are the platelets. Now, how much of these cells do we have in our blood? The count is generally expressed in terms of uh, a cubic millimeter or a microliter. They both come to the same thing. Micro means uh, uh, one millionth part, 10 raised to the power minus six, and uh, milli is uh, 1,000, 10 raised to the power minus three. So whether it's milliliter, sorry, cubic millimeter or microliter, it comes to the same thing. Let's stick to the simpler one, cubic millimeter. Now, what does cubic millimeter mean? Cubic millimeter means a cube, the space occupied by a cube, the each side of which is uh, one millimeter. So, this is one millimeter. So this cube is one cubic millimeter and comes to the same as one microliter. 
Now I am making this is because it's an extremely small volume about the size of a pinhead. Now within this small space, we have packed red blood cells to the tune of about 5 million. which is 5 into 10 to the power 6. White blood cells, 4,000 to 11,000 or so. That is the range, but say for simplicity, let's put 5,000. Five into 10 to the power 3. And platelets, about two lakhs. One lakh is 10 raised to the power five. So two multiplied by 10 raised to the power five. So the simple way to think of it is that the red blood cells are in terms of millions, white blood cells, thousands and platelets, lakhs. So that is the number of these cells in such a small volume as one cubic millimeter. Now with this, now I'll switch to the PowerPoint. Once again, I like to go to the sharing. Now. Top sharing. The YES project is a part of the 150th anniversary celebration of Sri and uh, 75 years of independence. So as we saw, blood uh, has plasma and cells. The fluid part is plasma and uh, into which are suspended the cells. And uh, the plasma uh, is a fluid that apart from uh, salts, uh, all salts or electrolytes, also has a significant amount of proteins. And these proteins include albumin, uh, globulins, which are antibodies, clotting proteins, that is proteins that participate in the clotting of blood, and uh, a variety of hormones, and binding proteins. The binding proteins are those you know, which uh, uh, bind small, uh, small molecules, like uh, hormones which have small molecules, so that they don't get lost here and there, and they can be released at the right place where the receptors for that hormone are available. It's something like, you know, holding the hand of a child so that the child is safely uh, taken to school or wherever you are taking the child and doesn't get lost on the way. So that is the function of the binding proteins. In general, one can say that plasma, in fact, transports uh, just about everything that needs to go in the body from one place to another. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, it serves as a mirror for uh, what is going on in the body. And that is why when we do the blood tests, you can measure so many things like uh, cholesterol or uh, the vitamin D levels or vitamin B12 levels, uh, iron levels, calcium levels. Now, all these things give us an idea of uh, the state of affairs in the rest of the body because in a way, blood mirrors what is happening in the rest of the body because it is circulating all over the body. And uh, in fact, the fluids of the body, both within the cell and outside the cell, are directly or indirectly uh, in communication with the fluid in the blood, that is the plasma. Now, sometimes you would have heard that uh, we talk in terms of uh, plasma and sometimes in terms of serum. Now, what is the difference between the two? If blood is left to clot, then uh, the fluid still oozes out from the clump of cells that has formed the clot, and this fluid that oozes out is the serum. 
So plasma minus clotting proteins is what we call serum. That is the difference between the two. And why both are used is because uh, in some tests, serum is more suitable, in some plasma is okay. Uh, but uh, the main thing is that these are the blood levels of the substances that we get, whether you measure in the plasma or in the serum. Now, cells are of three types, as we saw. The red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. Erythro means red. White blood cells, leukocytes. Leuco means white. And platelets are called thrombocytes because they participate in the process of thrombosis or clotting. They can help in forming a clot. The function of the red blood cells is to bind oxygen. They are essentially a bag containing, ox uh, containing hemoglobin. The hemoglobin has a great affinity for oxygen. And uh, we need oxygen all over the body in all the cells. This oxygen is transported by hemoglobin. If hemoglobin were not there, only a very small amount would dissolve in the plasma. Uh, but uh, it is because of uh, the hemoglobin that we are able to carry a much larger amount of oxygen transported from one place to another. Uh, when there's a reduction in the uh, hemoglobin in the blood, which could be either because the number of red cells has gone down or because uh, the cells have very little hemoglobin inside, that is, red cells have less hemoglobin than normal, the hemoglobin levels would come down. Now, as the hemoglobin level comes down, the capacity of the blood to transport will go down. And when the capacity of the blood to transport goes down, the reserve that we have for drawing upon extra oxygen in, say, the situations like exercise, that goes down, which means that the person then can't take exercise. He gets tired very easily, and uh, that's how uh, that's what happens in anemia. So, getting easily for getting uh, per, for a person who's getting easily tired, one of the reasons could be that the person has anemia. Now, what is it that leads to anemia? What are the causes of anemia? Logically, you can understand that it could be either because of uh, reduced production of the red blood cells, or increased destruction or abnormal losses of blood. Now let's look at these three one by one. Uh, one of the reasons for reduction in uh, the hemoglobin levels, which means uh, uh, the reduction in the red cells, uh, could be the reduced production of red blood cells. They're not being made in sufficient number. So there's a factory in the bone marrow, which is manufacturing the uh, red cells, but then the bone marrow needs some raw materials for manufacturing the red cells. And if this raw material is not enough, if some essential item is missing, just one item could make all the difference uh, and uh, the production would go down. And some of the critical materials which may be deficient are iron, folic acid, and vitamin B12. Uh, iron deficiency anemia is uh, the commonest type of anemia in India. And folic acid deficiency is also fairly common, especially in pregnant women. But vitamin B12 deficiency, luckily, is extremely rare. Uh, these three different types of uh, anemia can be distinguished one from the other. Uh, but uh, very often the clinical approach is that if the person has anemia, you go a bit of all the three. Uh, so that's why you find that many tablets have all these three together, iron, folic acid, and vitamin B12. The second reason why the production could be reduced is that everything is okay, the mat raw material is available, but the workers are on strike. Now that is what we call uh, uh, an aplastic anemia. That is uh, the cells which manufacture red blood cells have stopped working. And uh, that can happen in some situations. And this is one of those dreaded situations where we don't really know what to do because there's no sure shot mechanism by which we can uh, kickstart and sort of resolve this strike and make sure that they will start working again. So it's just a, essentially a question of wait and watch. But it's a, not a very common condition, luckily. But when it happens, it is one of the dreaded conditions. The second situation, the second reason for anemia could be that the red cells are being destroyed at a faster rate. The normal lifespan of a red cell is about 120 days or four months. But uh, when they are destroyed in much larger numbers, 
the production may not be able to keep pace with it and the person therefore develops anemia. And once again, the destruction could be due to two reasons. Either the red cells themselves are defective, as happens in thalassemia, or they are surrounding by, surrounded by some uh, toxic chemicals, as a uh, case of some drugs, which can lead to increased destruction of red cells when there's an adverse effect of the drug, and uh, snake venoms. Some snake venoms also increase the destruction of the red cells. So essentially, the increased destruction may be because the red cells themselves are weak, they're diseased and defective. Uh, that happens in thalassemia or because of antisocial elements in the surroundings. Then the third, abnormal losses. Abnormal losses may be considered as uh, excessive immigration, emigration, that is migrating out. Hmm? Migrating out in larger numbers and uh, these abnormal losses, some of the common situations where abnormal losses of blood may lead to anemia are heavy menstrual loss in women, piles and hookworm infestation. Uh, hookworms, you know, are in the uh, intestines and they are called hookworms because they have tiny little hooks by which they can cling to the intestine. And uh, through these hooks, they not only cling, but also produce a little small, little tiny wounds in the intestine which bleed and then the hookworms feed on that blood. So these are uh, some of the common situations in which uh, the anemia may be because of an abnormal loss of blood. Now we come to another disease closely related to the red cells and that is jaundice. Uh, jaundice, you know, is uh, because of the accumulation of one of the products of uh, the destruction of red cells and that is bilirubin. So as we saw, the lifespan of a red blood cell is about 120 days. And one of the products of the destruction is bilirubin. Bilirubin is processed in the liver and excreted in the, by the gallbladder. And uh, accumulation of bilirubin in the blood leads to jaundice. Let's try and see it a little more uh, in a pictorial fashion. So the... The red cell breakdown, uh, one of the products is bilirubin and uh, this bilirubin is then picked up by the liver, processed in the liver and uh, then excreted into the gallbladder and from the gallbladder it moves down the tube into the small intestine. And uh, after reaching the small intestine, uh, it is lost in feces. Some of it may, of course, get absorbed and enter the general circulation and may be lost in the urine. But then the yellow color of the stool is uh, primarily because of bilirubin. So bilirubin is a yellow colored dye. Now, if uh, that is how bilirubin is handled in the body, one can easily understand what is it that might lead to jaundice. Again, logically, one of the reasons could be that there's an excessive breakdown of red blood cells. They're breaking down in much la a very large number, and therefore the amount of bilirubin that is formed is uh, much more than normal, and uh, the liver can't handle it. So some of it will uh, accumulate in the blood. This backlog will keep collecting because the liver can't take up as much bilirubin as is being formed, and this excess is being formed because the RBCs are break breaking down uh, much more than they normally do. So excessive breakdown of red cells would not only lead to anemia, it would also can also lead to jaundice because bilirubin uh, may be produced maybe so much that the liver can't process it, take it up and process it. And so it, the backlog builds up in the blood. Now, bilirubin is not only taken up by the liver, it's also processed by the liver. So if the liver itself is defective, that would again leave bilirubin in the blood and uh, uh, it will not be able to pick up enough. So again, the backlog of bilirubin would build up in the blood because the liver is not able to pick up. So the amount of bilirubin formed may be normal, but because the liver itself is defective, it can't pick up the normal amounts of bilirubin and uh, therefore a backlog again builds up in the blood and this is to the second reason why there might be jaundice. So the first one, excessive RBC breakdown is what is called hemolytic jaundice. 
lytic you know is uh, breakdown lysis is breaking down so hemolytic jaundice is due to excessive breakdown of red blood cells and the second one when the if it is due to the liver being defective is hepatic jaundice because uh, hepatic refers to the liver and uh, here the liver is defective for example in hepatitis and uh, the third reason why there may be jaundice is because there is an obstruction somewhere in the gallbladder because of stones in the gallbladder or stones in the gallbladder duct or cancer of the gallbladder or cancer of the head of the pancreas which presses on the uh, duct here, you know, the pancreas. This uh, tube coming from the gallbladder opens in, uh, in the part of the intestine that we call uh, that we call the duodenum immediately after the stomach. It's a C-shaped loop and nestled in this C is the pancreas. So if there's a cancer of the pancreas, that would also press on this tube and lead to the same type of obstruction. So, but the commonest cause of obstruction is stones in the gallbladder. And uh, the result would be that uh, once again, bilirubin, uh, would uh, build up uh, in the liver and from liver spill over into the general circulation and uh, give rise to jaundice. Now you can see there can be two types of bilirubin that may collect in the blood. In case of uh, excessive breakdown and in case of uh, liver disease, the bilirubin that collects is the one uh, which has not yet been processed by the liver. In one case, the liver has not been able to process it because uh, uh, the too much is being formed. In another case, it has not been processed by the liver because the liver is defective. But in the third situation, the liver has processed it and therefore the type of bilirubin that was accumulate is the one which uh, has been already processed by the liver. And these two different types of bilirubin is what is called direct and indirect bilirubin. And that is what you see in your report sometimes. Total bilirubin this much, direct this much, indirect this much. So these two types of bilirubin, why there are two types now you can understand. Okay. <clears throat> now turning to the white blood cells. The total count, which is generally called the TLC, is uh, 4,000 to 11,000. These days you don't really have to remember all these figures because uh, in the lab reports, you have the normal range given. And along with that, what uh, your report is, uh, and if it is only sl even slightly different from the normal range, it is printed in bold. Why I emphasized slightly was because uh, a slight difference is not necessarily significant. But then, you know, it's an automated process. And therefore, if uh, the machine has been told that uh, a neutrophil count of less than 40% is uh, abnormal, then even if it is 39, it will show it in bold. So that is where your own judgment comes in. So anyway, so coming back to the differential leukocyte count or DLC, uh, of all the white blood cells, 40 to 75% are neutrophils, 20 to 45% lymphocytes, 2 to 10% monocytes, 1 to 6% eosinophils, and 0 to 1% basophils. Now, zero does not mean that there are, the person doesn't have any basophils. Uh, what it means is that uh, in the area that was counted, no basophil was detected because the number is so small that one may not detect the basophil. But if one uh, examines a much larger area or more fields under the microscope, sooner or later, some basophils would be seen. Now, what are the functions of these different types of cells? The neutrophils are phagocytes. They eat up germs and other undesirable substances. And therefore, their number goes up in infections, particularly uh, those infections which are acute, in which, which are called pyogenic, which may produce pus. These are the type of uh, infections in which neutrophil count goes up. It also goes up when there's excessive tissue breakdown, as in case of, say, myocardial infarction, that is uh, a heart attack in which uh, uh, a significant amount of uh, muscle tissue in the heart it has died and uh, then also the neutrophil count goes up. And it doesn't necessarily go up because a larger number of neutrophils is being manufactured. 
Apart from the neutrophils that circulate, there's quite a bit held in reserve. And this reserve is then sent into the circulation uh, in any situation where they are needed in a large number. So when they are needed, and in case of dead tissue also, again, they are needed to clear the debris. So whenever they are needed, they can be, the reserves can be called upon. Eosinophils uh, in generally increase in number in allergies. And uh, one of the hypotheses is that they reduce the ferocity of the allergic reaction. The reaction, the allergic reaction would be much more intense if the eosinophils were not there. The second situation in which they increase is uh, in case of parasitic infestations. That is uh, uh, large uh, if, uh, infections by large organisms like say worms. Now, uh, worms are too big to be phagocytosed by cells like neutrophils. But what eosinophils can do is to stick on the surface of these uh, worms, these parasites, and kill them. So the eosinophil acts like a snake for these. So it just gives its stings. Through its sting, it can kill those worms. So that is one of the... Uh, that. So these are the two situations in which they are very useful and we know what their function is. And this corresponds to uh, these two functions, reducing the ferocity of the allergic reactions and taking care of parasitic infestations. So in parasitic infections like worms, etc., and in allergies, the eosinophil count is high. Basophils, uh, their function is somewhat obscure, but uh, they seem to be important uh, participants in the healing mechanisms. They, con they contain granules. They are jam-packed with blue granules, which contain histamine. And the histamine that they release can produce itching. And uh, that is what explains the itching that you experience in the skin uh, when the skin is about to heal. In the, initially, the wound may be painful. After that, there's neither pain nor anything. It's just healing. But then when the healing is uh, at its peak, that is when it may start itching. The monocytes are again phagocytes but then they act as phagocytes uh, when they enter the tissues, uh, not in the blood itself. So they uh, enter the tissues and act as um, phagocytes. We'll talk a little more about them when we come to the immune system. And lymphocytes, again, we'll talk in detail when we come to the immune system. And uh, uh, the lymphocytes are primarily the cells of the immune system. In that, we shall talk about in the next session, uh, which will be on Friday, next theory session. Then the platelet count. The count we have seen is about 2 lakhs per cubic millimeter. And the functions of uh, the platelets are, uh, when there is a wound, the first line of defense is that there's a constriction of blood vessels. The blood vessels become narrow. And this is because of the release of constricting substances from the platelets. Then there is the formation of a platelet plug. That is, the platelets themselves form a sort of a plug which uh, seals the opening, closes the breach that uh, has resulted from this injury. Uh, so there's formation of a platelet plug. But this platelet plug is not something which is very dependable and reliable for stopping the bleeding. Uh, the process of clotting is initiated and platelets help also in the process of clotting. And when a proper clot has been formed, then only one uh, can be a little more sure of the bleeding stopping. And uh, the a clot is essentially a large number of red cells caught in a web of uh, blood cells and blood cells are mostly red cells. So the blood cells, which will be predominantly red, cell, red blood cells, caught in a web of threads which are formed by a protein called fibrinogen, which is converted into fibrin in the process of clotting. So uh, there's a sort of a weaving of uh, these uh, fibrin fibers uh, in a crisscross manner, uh, which binds a large number of blood cells together. But then this, these threads that have uh, wrapped around this uh, collection of blood need to be tightened for the clot to become firm and smaller. And that tightening is once again a result of a chemical released from the platelets. So the platelets participate in all aspects of prevention of bleeding from a wound, starting with the initial constriction 
and the final retraction of the plot. And that is why when a person's platelet count goes down, there's a tendency to bleed. Tendency to bleed under the skin, tendency to bleed inside the body from internal organs, which is uh, much more risky and not so obvious. And uh, these are the risks of a low platelet count leading to excessive bleeding. We'll wait for uh, this uh, gardener's equipment. I believe now I should be audible. Now we come to another subject of popular interest and that is blood groups. Now each red cell has on its surface some characteristic proteins uh, which we may call antigens. Antigen is a protein which is capable of giving rise to an antibody or which evokes the production of an antibody. Antibody is a protein which circulates in the plasma and uh, has a structure which is complementary to the antigen so that uh, the antigen and the antibody can enter into a lock and key type of uh, relationship. So there can be a lock and key type of uh, an attachment between the antigen and the antibody. So these are the red cells and say so this is the antigen on the surface of the red cells. Then corresponding to this antigen, the antibodies would be somewhat like this. I mean, pictorially represented like this uh, to facilitate understanding. So if this antigen is a triangular shape, there will be a triangular hollow in the antibody so that they can fit into each other like a lock and a key. Now imagine uh, this type of red cells present in the same, suspended in the same plasma, which has this type of antibodies. What would be the result? The result would be that these red cells will form a clump like this. And this clump is of no use in the circulation. It will block the blood vessels and uh, lead to uh, circulatory problems. And in case of uh, vital organs like the heart or the lungs, this type of clumping in the vessels which supply the blood uh, would lead to death. So this type of clumping of red cells is not desirable. And uh, therefore, we find that uh, if the red cells have a particular type of antigen on their surface, the corresponding antibody is not present in the blood of the same person. Okay, The person does not have this type of antibodies. Now, the antigens on the red cells are of two types, A and B. And corresponding to this, there are two different types of antibodies, which we may call anti-A and anti-B. And therefore, you can uh, now understand that the person who has A type of antigens on the red cells should not have anti-A antibodies in the blood. And a person who has B type of antigen on the surface of the red cells should not have anti-B type of antibodies in the plasma. Now, corresponding to this, we have these four blood groups. If the antigen on the red cell is of the A type, the person has belongs to blood group A. If the antigen is of the B type, then the person's blood group is B. If the person has both types of antigens, then the person's blood group is AB. And uh, if uh, the person has no antigen on the red cells, then the person has blood group O. Now, in case of uh, the person who has antigen of the A variety on the red cell surface, the type of antibody that is present is anti-B because these two will not interact with each other and therefore these red cells will not clump. In case of uh, if the person has B type of antigen on the red cells, the antibody in the plasma is anti-A. If the person has both a and B type of antigens on the red cell surface, the person has neither anti-A nor anti-B, no antibodies of this type in the blood. And if the person has no antigen on the surface of the red cells, the person has both anti-A and anti-B in the plasma. So the person who has a combination of antigen A on the red cell surface, anti-B type of antibodies in the plasma is said to have blood group A. The person who has B type of antigen on the red cell surface, anti-A type of antibodies in the plasma, this person's blood group is B. When the person has both antigen A and B on the red cell surface, no antibodies of neither anti-A nor, nor anti-B in the plasma, then the person's blood group is AB. And if the person has neither A nor B on the 
surface and both anti A and anti B in the plasma, the person's blood group is O. Now we'll go to a few uh, suggested readings and then open to questions and answers. Uh, I've added one more beautiful book uh, to the suggested reading list, Principles of Anatomy and Physiology by Tortora and Grabowski. Uh, probably the latest edition has been, uh, in the latest edition Tortora has been joined by others as well. So, uh, but anyway, this is a classic uh, Principles of Anatomy and Physiology, now probably running into its 14th edition. It's rather fat, more than 1,000 pages, but it's an excellent book. Very well illustrated, beautiful pictures. And well, also, of course, beautiful text. And uh, near our home, you have uh, this book, uh, which is nearly 30 year old now, but updated from time to time. The last edition, latest edition is 2018, The Human Machine. This is addressed to the general public and published by the National Book Trust, which publishes only popular science books, not textbooks. These are textbooks. Textbooks, are about 400 pages long, Fundamentals of Physiology, and about 1,000 pages, Understanding Medical Physiology. And then we have uh, these wiki books, Human Anatomy, Human Physiology, and another work in progress, more and more books being added under the Health Science heading. And uh, here you have two books for free download uh, from uh, Dr. John Campbell, uh, one on physiology and one on pathophysiology. Uh, this is uh, the place where I stay and work. If you have any questions or comments, please drop an email to yes at yesspirituality.com. Gratitude to the mother and Sri Aurobindo for uh, making these sessions possible. And thank you all for being there.